went, well, you know, I, I got to be honest. I, when I come in, I sit down the very front, and I can't see behind me. And some people come in a little late, and I get up here, and it's like, wow, people should. It's good work. Let's worship. All right. Um, yeah, great to see the kids, you know, just walking around every, every year. Uh, praise God for that. Yeah, that's, uh, um, you know, a privilege and really great responsibility for us as believers as we think about uh, the church in this world and the surrounding society and uh, our call and duty to re- just pass down the good news to the, the next generations, and God's just blessed us richly with that. So um, it's fun to see them here. Um, and uh, yeah, so also a thanks to Mark Logman who, who preached last Sunday um, as I was away with uh, some of our leadership from the church. We were down at Asbury Seminary for a weekend, uh, which was good and just gave me excitement and encouragement for uh, what God's doing in, in our church family and, and what he may be just continuing to lead us towards. Uh, just being to brainstorm and pray and talk and be together with that group of guys was great um, last, last week. Um, so we got home Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Pastor James. James and Pastor Josh and I were at our district conference, and that was kind of more of the same. You know, there's some business stuff there that's uh, that's boring and you just got to work through, but also just being with uh, pastors from the Ohio Valley District to get to see what God's doing in our region uh, was really encouraging as well. There's some neat stuff happening, and uh, that's actually, you know, th- uh, 6% of uh, every dollar that, that we all give to the general fund goes to our district. So it's, it's good to see just what is happening there. It doesn't just support uh, the office staff, um, uh, over half of that goes directly into ministry and church planting and, and mostly new uh, new churches that are developing. Um, I got to talk with a couple pastors, uh, a couple deaf pastors who are planting deaf churches and just a, a really neat thing to see down in Kentucky, one in Columbus, um, only 2% of the deaf community uh, has heard the gospel. And, you know, it's like, wow, that broke my heart just to know, like, that's an unreached people group. But just to see them, they're, they're flourishing. And so the, that disabled ministry was, was pretty cool. There's some other stuff um, within the district. So it was good uh, to be away, but also good to be back. And I know my wife would second that. I was just helping out with the kids. So, um, But, you know, when, when we were moving down or driving down to Kentucky, uh, our church has two vans. One of them's kind of old, one of them's newer, and we're going to take the old one, but it was like out of oil. So there's a problem there we got to look into. At any rate, this new van, uh, we're driving down 75, and if you've gone down 75, like all the way into Kentucky, you know sometimes like traffic just goes, and you just kind of go with it, right? Um, I did not get a speeding ticket, but... uh, You know, it's a van full of guys, so we're all just talking, hanging out, and then the next thing you know, you look down, it's like, man, I'm moving along pretty good. You got to back off a little bit, and but you know, if if there's a a state highway patrolman and and I get pulled over, at that point, it's like, you're right, like I I blew it, I deserve it, you know, and um, that didn't happen, fortunately, but uh, there's there's consequences when we do things that are wrong, right? And that ties into what we're facing this week with Easter Sunday coming, Resurrection Sunday coming. Um, There's this balance of the sin of the world, the sin of our own hearts, but also God's grace and His goodness. And uh, we'll talk today even a little bit more just how uh, sin, uh, which is how we call it in the the church world, wrongdoing, uh, bad decisions, they deserve consequences. They deserve uh, you know, that's, that's what justice is, right? And, and any environment that's going to allow love to be sustained, there has to be justice. Um, so, so what do we do with that as believers? Um, just, just thinking about uh, when we do something wrong, it deserves some punishment, but how, what do we do with that? And, and maybe this morning as you think about it, maybe there's some things in your life recently or not so recently that you feel some guilt for or you're ashamed of, or you wish you never would have done that, or saw that, or experienced that. And and that's hitting us at different levels, right? Some of us may be on the receiving end of the brokenness and hurt in this world, and uh, we're suffering the consequences of that. Maybe some of us more on the proactive side, we did some things, said some things that we shouldn't have done. Uh, Is it right that that wrongdoing deserves some sort of consequence? 
Uh, scripture seems to say so. So, so what do we do with that? Uh, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We'll see that God provides a way out for His people. And what I hope to do is tie together a little bit the Old Testament with the New Testament. The, so when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, uh, he, he was going there to celebrate, all the, the Israelites were there to celebrate the Passover feast, right? Which looked back to when the Israelites were captured in Egypt and God called them out of Egypt and, and he passed over his people, right? So that's an exodus. So this morning we're going to look at exodus and uh, a few uh, verses from the New Testament and just tie that together and see how God's narrative throughout all history was really building up to this climactic event on the cross, uh, which has direct implications for just our, our personal life. So uh, let me pray for us, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share six observations and just talk about those a little bit, uh, hopefully to invite God to, to work. So let's pray. Father God, um, you know, we just come before you now, and we open up your word, and we do believe it to be true. And uh, so we're praying, Lord, that through your spirit, you'd just be at work this morning in, in ways that only you can. And God, I want to lift up to you uh, individuals in this room who maybe come in just with uh, hard experiences from the past or maybe even currently in their life, maybe uh, sin has a stronghold or just holding back or holding down in some way. Uh, Lord, I'm praying that you uh, would just call them out of that place. And uh, Lord, if, if there be some who haven't received your, your blessing and, and perfect gift in the person of Jesus, that uh, that, that would happen in this place uh, this morning. And God, we know uh, your church and, and the way we do church is not about uh, numbers, but um, I'm really happy to see that we have a pretty full sanctuary and this COVID pandemic, uh, Lord willing, is falling farther and farther into the rearview mirror, and we can press on as a people uh, who take joy and count it a privilege to be together and to worship. So I'm just happy uh, to see see us together this morning and uh, for our, all these kids walking around waving palm branches. Lord, we pray that uh, you would allow them to know it's, it's so much more than that, and it has a deep meaning for uh, who they are and who they'll become. And we just thank you for for bringing them here and and pray that you would help us to raise them up. Um, And uh, yeah, we just, we get our eyes back to to the sermon this morning. Pray that you would speak to us uh, clearly. And uh, as we look at a lot of scripture and and maybe spend a a little more time, God, we pray that you would just use it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we got six observations here to share. I'll just share an observation, talk about it a little bit. and, and we'll tie together Old Testament and New. So if you're following along with, with your Bible, you'd be, be ready to, to chase some pages, uh, flipping back and forth. But uh, first observation I want to share, God sees, sin of, uh, God sees the sin of the world. God sees the sin of the world. So, so nothing profound there, right? Pretty foundational to the Christian faith. Uh, God sees that this world can be a mess. He sees our sin individually. He sees the world's sin corporately. God sees. Um, That's good news if you're on the receiving end of some hardship. You've you've had some hard things happen. That's good news because God sees that. He sees what's happening. Um, uh, For better or for worse, uh, we can't hide from God. Right? Not the words that we speak, not the thoughts that we think, not the things that we do. God sees it all. He sees this mess. Um, and uh, where can we see this played out in Scripture? I'm going to start this morning, Luke uh, chapter 19, uh, 41 through 44. I think this gives us just a good snapshot of the reality that, that God, through His Son Jesus, Jesus Himself, sees just the, the fallenness of this world. So this is when Jesus is approaching Jerusalem. He's riding up to Jerusalem on the donkey. That's fulfillment of uh, Zechariah, right? He's, he's coming up as, as the king. And he's going, uh, as he's approaching Jerusalem to go to the cross, right? He knows it's coming. Uh, this, this is what he says. So when he drew near and he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, Jerusalem, had known on this day the things that make for peace, 
But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So again, I think that's a great text just to summarize the heart of God as he saw his people in a mess. He saw the sin of Israel. Right? He saw the brokenness of his people, and now the enemy's going to bring this destruction. And he's saying, if you would have just known what brings peace, but they didn't. Um, so how about uh, the Old Testament, Exodus? We're going to look at this first Passover event. So Exodus 2, we kind of see the same reality that states God, is, God sees what's happening here. Exodus 2, 23 through 25 so you remember, Israel had been uh, taken into Egypt. They're taken captive. They're enslaved. Uh, they're, they're crying out to God, you know, just begging for, for his attention, his mercy. And verse 23, chapter 2, During those many days the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. That's amazing. God saw their pain. He knew they were crying out, right? He knew they were being oppressed. He knew the hurt from the sinfulness of the people in Egypt. And I love how it ends there. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. You know, God knows when his children need some help. God knew sin was there in Egypt, and, and this uh, makes me think about, you know, sitting at home, when may, maybe in the living room, and the kids are out in the yard playing on the play set. Maybe all four of them are out there messing around, having a good time, and going down the slide, swinging on the swings, and, and they're getting along so well, and you're like, oh, isn't this great? You know, they're just caring for each other. That's what, this nice family unit, and then all of a sudden, something happens, right? And the kids start to, to get upset. Somebody said something they shouldn't have. Somebody maybe gives a little shove or they don't let them down the slide or somebody's climbing up the slide and you only go down the slide, right? And, and you're, I'm, I'm sitting there watching this from start to finish. I'm watching. And, and if, if something happens to a certain extent, I can go out there, right, break up this argument or defend the one who's, who's innocent and discipline the one who's guilty maybe if need be. And, you know, you watch this unfold and they don't know I'm watching. But I'm watching through the window. And after a while, they come up to the house, and you know what's coming, right? They did this. They said this. And, and, and you take them in, and you're like, I know. I've been watching. I saw from start to finish. I know who provoked it. I know who's innocent, right? I saw it all. Now, I don't hear it all as God does. But it's the same with God. He's watching this mess out here. We're button heads with people. Somebody's hurting us. We're hurting somebody else. He's up there. I know. What's this line say? God sees the people, and he knows. In the right moment, he can step out and break up the fight if he needs to or punish the one who's guilty if he needs to or defend the one who's oppressed if he needs to, right? God, God is aware of this. He sees the sin in the world. Uh, second observation, God invites repentance, so we're caught up in this mess of wrongdoing. God's continuously inviting us out of that. Right? He's continuously inviting people to repent, to turn towards him. Uh, Exodus 5, 1 is where we see it. So you remember uh, Pharaoh, the man we call Pharaoh, takes over, and, and he's overseeing all these Israelites, right? Uh, he's using them to build up this kingdom in, in Egypt. Um, and and here's, here's God's invitation for Pharaoh to turn away from his wrongdoing. Chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and they said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. It's an invitation. Pharaoh, you got my people, but you need to let them go. You need to let them go and worship in the wilderness. What, he, what he's really inviting Pharaoh to do there is, is to help put creation back into right order right? These people are here to worship, and you're not letting them worship. 
So let them go so that they can do what they were created to do. That's what we do when we turn towards God. We're helping put creation back into the order it was meant to be in. Right? He's, he's inviting Pharaoh uh, to follow after him. Um, I, I know one thing I, I've maybe shared before. Right after I graduated high school, I went on, on my first mission trip. We first went down to Texas. And, and we were in Texas for a few days getting training. And while in Texas, there was worship. And, and it was just a, a bunch of teenagers from all over the country together worshiping. It was an environment of worship I had never experienced before. Right? Just a bunch of kids. And, and we're, so we're worshiping, and, and God put it pretty clearly in my heart that I needed to change the music I was listening to. Because back home, it wasn't anything like I was experiencing there in worship. And this was uplifting. This was God honoring. And he puts it in, in, into my mind that like, you need to make a little shift here. Invitation, right? He's inviting me to step out. He's inviting me to put creation back in right order right? You shouldn't be filling your mind with this. You shouldn't be filling your heart with this. He's, he's continuously inviting us. And I wonder, maybe this morning, there's something in your life that God's inviting you to change. Is he calling you out of something to help put stuff back into right order? Uh, maybe there's something there uh, for us to think about. Now, where do we see this in Jesus's ministry, uh, this idea of uh, repentance? Uh, Mark chapter 1, um, and we, we could pull these from all over. These are just one example. But uh, Mark 1, so this is where uh, John the Baptist, he's, he's baptizing Jesus, introducing Jesus. So John appeared, John the Baptist, he appeared, this is verse 4, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So there it is. Uh, he's inviting these Israelites to repent, right, to turn back to do what uh, God wants them to do. Jesus reaffirms this a little bit later in his own ministry, verse 14 into 15, after John was arrested, so John's bound up, uh, so Jesus begins his ministry, he goes into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, and he says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel, repent, God's inviting us to get out of the sin that he sees in the world. He's inviting repentance. If we're sensing it in our life, God is inviting that. That is the work of God, and He's inviting us to step out and to turn towards Him. A third observation, the sinner doesn't see God. The sinner doesn't see God. Exodus 5, we just read uh, verse 1 of Exodus 5. That was uh, Moses and Aaron telling, telling Pharaoh, let my people go, right, from the Lord. Listen to what Pharaoh says. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now, that one's easy, right? He didn't see him. He doesn't see God. Pharaoh, God says, let my people go so that they can go out into the wilderness and they can worship as they were meant to do. And Pharaoh says, who is this Lord you're talking about? I don't know anything about him. Forget that. I'm not going to let the people go. I'm not going to follow uh, whatever this God is uh, speaking, right? Because Pharaoh was seated on the throne of his own heart. He was going to call the shots, right? He had a nice workforce build up, and he had big plans to accomplish with that workforce. God's trying to take it away. No, I'm not going to let him go. I even, who is this God you're speaking of? He continues with his own life, the way uh, that he had been living. Uh, Where do we see this in the New Testament? John 12, 37. That's where we'll look at here. John 12, 37 through 40. Uh, We see the same reality uh, lived out as Jesus shows up, right? So Jesus shows up uh, living his life, doing ministry, uh, 37 through 40. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and he hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. So you see, it's the same reality there in Pharaoh's life and these Pharisees and scribes, 
right? They were so far off the track for so long that they couldn't even see God anymore. Jesus, the embodiment of God, was standing right before them, and they didn't see it. They missed him completely because they had been so far off the track, they don't even see him anymore. Their eyes were blind. Their hearts were calloused, right? Scripture says that if Basically, if, no matter what we're desiring, God's going to give us the desire of our heart. And if we're desiring sin, He's going to give us sin. The way the Scripture says is, He will hand you over to your sinful desires. And, and it appears God had handed them over to these desires to the point that they can't even see anymore. They don't even hear Him anymore. Jesus makes a proposal. He did all these signs to try and reveal Himself to say, Hey, here I am. They didn't get it. The sinner who's so far sucked into sin that they can't even see God. They don't hear Him at all. The sinner doesn't see God. Um, and I think there's something interesting you know, at work here as we think about people today, specifically our, our younger generations. Um, it oftentimes seems true, and it, it, maybe this was true in your life, that uh, you, you lived your life at a time where you weren't following after God, maybe right? But I'd say many of you may say it wasn't because of lack of belief. Like you actually believe that God was there and you believe that God was real. The greater issue is just personal pride or personal preference as to how you wanted to do life. You didn't want to submit to him. You didn't want to give up. You didn't want to pay the cost. Or you think of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, let my people go. Well, there's a high cost with that. He lets his people go. He lets go of his whole workforce. What is there? Like a million of them. Gone. And, and we think of our young people. Uh, follow the Lord. Follow after me. Turn away from this wrongdoing. Repent. Right? And all of a sudden, in their mind, starts rattling off all the implications of obeying God. Well, you want to stand for God in society today, it's a lot harder than years ago. Not even that many years ago. You gotta stand against abortion. You gotta stand against same sex marriage. You gotta maybe give up some things you were doing on the weekend with your friends. You gotta maybe break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend because you're not acting the way you should. You gotta change the way you dress because God has preference about how we dress. And, and there's a big cost there. You believe that God's real, but not quite ready to give all that over. The implications are too high. The cost is too great. And, and the, what Scripture is pointing out here, if we just continue in that, we will end up in a spot where then we look up to God or we hear any thought of God and we just say, what are you talking about? This God, this Lord you speak of. I'm, I'm okay doing my thing because we've gone so far off the tracks, we don't even hear Him anymore. We don't even see Him anymore. The thought of God becomes foolish. Right? But is it really, uh, was it belief or just personal pride? I'd say even with Pharaoh, his pride was just driving it hard. Right? He, he wanted a kingdom. He wanted to build Egypt. Um, so just a, a side comment there for, uh, especially I think our young people who are in process and in formation of your faith, um, if, if you continue, God won't be real in your mind for sure because that Wrong living, doesn't, it doesn't even allow you to see it or to receive it. Uh, there's an invitation here uh, for our young people to take a bold stand and follow after God too. And as you yield to Him, His voice will grow louder. His voice will grow more clear. And you will begin to experience His love and His grace and His goodness. And God will be as real as anything else you experience in this world. Um, so that's side comment, but uh, observation four, so that was people living in sin don't see God. Uh, observation four, sin deserves punishment. Exodus four, twenty-one to 23, we see this play out in the, the first Passover event. Exodus four, twenty-one to 23. So this was after uh, Pharaoh had had some invitation, right? Let my people go. God sent Moses and Aaron. He wasn't responding. So verse 21, The Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power. Sounds like Jesus, right? He performed all these signs. They still missed him. 
Do all the miracles I put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go so that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Now, that's getting interesting, right? Firstborn son. Who comes to mind? Jesus. Firstborn son. Israel, God's firstborn son in the world, put here to represent who God is, right? To, to reveal who God is in this world. And the invitation again, uh, Pharaoh, let him go. You got a hold of my son. Let my son go so that he can worship. Now, now there's a consequence that he's stating, right? I've invited you out. I've given you a chance. Verse 23, if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Now, the temptation there is we stand back and we say, how horrible. That's terrible. How's, how's this a good God? Right? He, he's going to kill a firstborn son? But as we breathe out these accusations, we fail to cast any bit of responsibility onto Pharaoh who has his grip on God's firstborn son and is literally killing him day by day, moment by moment, silencing the voice of God's son in this world. Pharaoh's destroying Israel. Is any consequence appropriate? Is, is there a consequence that's reasonable? What is the appropriate punishment for killing someone's son? The problem, I think, is we don't really know. Right? We, we think we can assess this, but, but we don't understand pure justice. So God's saying, Pharaoh, you got a hold of my son. You let him go. If you don't, I'm killing yours. Justice. Eye for an eye. Let's rebalance the scales here. It seems harsh, but Pharaoh's he's receiving invitation, right? Sin will be punished. Now, where do we see this in the New Testament? We see uh, in the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus has uh, spent a lot of time with the Pharisees, a lot of time with the scribes, and he's warning them continuously, let my people go, repent, right? You, you can read the, the seven woes, and Jesus tells them they're hypocrites, and they're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they look good, but on the inside, they're, they're impure. And he says they're, they're leading people astray. And, and he says, uh, you say you love the prophets, but if you would have lived when the prophets do, you would have you been standing against them. Like he's just rebuking them, rebuking them. And, and basically, the Pharisees and the scribes, spiritually, they're blowing it. They're living in sin. They're living in wrongdoing. And what's Jesus say? Matthew 23, 33, you serpents. You brood of vipers, how are you ever going to escape being sentenced to hell? That's the words of Jesus. You guys are blowing it. Turn away from that. They just keep persisting, keep persisting. He gets to a point, he's like, you guys are serpents. How are you going to escape eternal punishment, eternal consequence? Is consequence reasonable? The rebellion against God, is, is that reasonable? I think so. Jesus is saying, you're going, to be, you're going to be sent to hell. How are you going to escape it? You're so blind, you can't see anymore. Jesus is telling them they're on this path to destruction. Uh, so who could protect them, right? And maybe here we pause for a moment and we do a, a little internal investigation. It's wrongdoing. God sees it. He knows. We can't hide it. Maybe nobody knows about it. God knows. He's in the living room, he might say, watching out. He sees it all unfolding. If you're being hurt by sin or you're causing sin, God knows. And consequence is reasonable, right? Punishment is reasonable. That's how justice is preserved. If, if we're living in sin, God's inviting us to stop. He's inviting us to get out and to follow after him. He's inviting us into a life that is life-giving in the way that he had designed it, right? But if we don't, and we choose to keep persisting in that, his voice will grow silent, our eyes will grow blind, and we'll just continue on with that. Sin deserves punishment. So what do we do? What do we do? You're caught up in it. You want out. You want forgiveness. You don't want to pay the consequence. You know, okay, it's reasonable there's a consequence, but I don't want to do that. 
I just want this burden lifted. I want the guilt gone. I don't want to be ashamed. How do we, how do we go about doing that? And, and here we ease into uh, the good news of Easter week, right? Palm Sunday. A fifth observation, God provides a way out. God provides a way out. So look at this, Exodus 12. We're going to see real clearly that God provides a way out for His people. So I'm going to read all of this. I thought about just touching on it, but I want to read all of it just to, to build our understanding and, um, of, of this text. What, what happened at the original Passover versus what happened in the life of Jesus. So uh, here's God's way out. <clears throat> He'd warned Pharaoh, told him to let people go. He's not going to do it. So God says, all right, uh, the plagues are coming, basically. Consequence is coming. Uh, ver- chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt... This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. So tell all the congregation of Israel, tell them all, that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbors shall take according to the number of the persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. So take note of that. We'll come back to it. 14th day. They go and get them on the 10th. They keep them for five days. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay? You keep them to the the 14th day. When the whole assembly of, of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So that fifth day you kill them. Then they shall take some of the blood, and they shall put the blood on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains in the morning you shall burn. Get rid of all of it. Destroy it. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Basically, Ready to go. You eat it, you be ready to go. Because when the Lord's coming, it's time to move. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. All right. There's God's escape plan. He's provided a way out. He sees Egypt. He sees it's a mess. Sin everywhere. He's going to bring destruction. Firstborn. Everybody's firstborn. Man and beast. But there's a way out for some. And he lays out this plan here. Right? There's a way to be spared. Go get the lamb. Day 10. Go get your lamb. Sacrifice it. Eat it all. If you can't eat all of it, destroy what's left. Get your belt on. Get your sandals on. Get your staff in your hand. Be ready to go. Because when I come, it's time to go. Eat it in haste. Right? Put the, put the blood on the, the doorposts. And, and when sweep through to, to take the firstborn, any door that has blood on the doorpost, safe. Good to go. No consequence there. But turn an eye to that one. Just fly over that house, right? People of the blood are safe. Now, where do we see this in the New Testament? We can all begin to see where this is heading. Uh, We we looked at this in in John's gospel uh, already. John chapter 1, John 1, 29. Uh, So John the Baptist had been preparing the way for Jesus, right? The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. He's provided a way out. A perfect sacrifice without any blemish, right? The firstborn Son of God has come uh, to provide this way out. This Lamb's death will ensure that you all can live. So what happened on that original Palm Sunday? People wave their palm branches and they throw down their jackets and their coats and and they're welcoming Jesus as a king, right? The 
problem is they received him as a king and they were ready to be lifted up high and become a nation that was powerful in this world and ruled over other nations like Pharaoh might have in Egypt. They were ready for that guy. Bring us some power. We're with you. They're ready to receive the king, but they weren't ready to receive the lamb. God provided a lamb for his people. They weren't ready to to have any talk about turning away, any talk about acknowledging sin or repentance or or receiving this lamb in humility. They wanted the power of a king. God provided a way out for the people there. And and we get to this point, you see there's two categories of people, right? In all creation, in Scripture, in the world, two categories of people. There's a category that they uh, acknowledge God. They hear God. They see God. Uh, they're going to respond to God, and then there's another side. They don't see him. Who is he? I don't want him turning away, not going to listen, doing things my way. I'm going to make up my mind and, and just march on, right? It's two categories of people, and Palm Sunday is this reminder that we get a chance to jump the fence, you might say. If we're headed in the wrong way. We can say, all right, I want in. I want to receive this lamb. I got some problems in my life. Some sin in there from years ago, a week ago, a day ago. Maybe you're stuck in it right now. Deserves some punishment. Deserves some consequence. I don't want to pay for it. Here's a lamb. You want passed over here? Here's a lamb. You can receive him. Palm Sunday is our chance to receive this, this Jesus as king, but also as a lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. Uh, Last observation for us. Number six, God's people are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Exodus 12, God's people are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, this is 12, 28. So this is after God had given them all these directions, okay? He told them what to do. You sacrifice your lamb. You put the blood on the post. You eat it in haste. You, you go through all these things. And it says, verse 28, Then the people of Israel went and did so. As the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. I read that, and my mind immediately went back just a few weeks ago. You remember, we were in the Gospel of John. We were talking about the wedding ceremony, and, and the wine ran out, right? And, and Mary went up to, to Jesus, and she says, hey, they're out of wine. We've got a problem here. And Jesus says, hey, this doesn't concern me. Leave me alone. And, and Mary looks at, at Jesus' friends, and what she tell them? Do whatever he tells you. And she leaves. It's the same thing here. God tells them this crazy series of events. Go find a lamb on the 10th day and, and then sacrifice it. And make sure you eat everything. Don't boil it. You got to roast it. And if there's anything left, burn it all up and get your belt on, get your uh, sandals on, get your staff ready, get the right herbs there. And, and you do all these things and they just do it. That's what God's people do because they can hear God and they believe and they trust and they follow God leads in a direction, and they do it. They received this from Moses and Aaron, and so they did. A response to God's invitation, right? A response to receive God's plan, his escape plan, right? Uh, To get out of this mess. Now, where do we see it? In the New Testament, we're winding down. Matthew 26. So this is the Last Supper, so this is Jesus was in Jerusalem now. He's already approached Jerusalem. He's in Jerusalem with his disciples, and they were there to celebrate the Passover feast. The Passover is remembering what just happened in Exodus when all the Israelites were led out of Egypt, right? So they're celebrating that. There was a time when God passed us over. He was gracious. He led us out. So here they are at the Lord's Supper. Uh, they're remembering what took place there. And verse 26, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave to the disciples. And listen to what he, listen to what he says, Take and eat, this is my body. He took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave the cup to them, and he said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, we see what Jesus did there. He just went into one of the most important, sacred events of the Israelite community, right? Their annual remembrance of what happened back in Egypt when God delivered them, and he messes with it. He, he steals the show. 
don't remember any sheep that was sacrificed, right? Don't, don't worry about bringing the lamb in for sacrifice every year. I'm telling you, from this day forward, this is my body, and this is my blood. You don't worry about any sheep blood on your doorposts. You just get my heart, my, my blood over your heart, right? Anybody who's got this blood of Christ, the Lamb, the perfect Son of God, who's come to take away the sins of the world, you got that blood over you. When Judgment Day comes, and it'll come, and that's fair, right? Passed over, good to go, safe, in the clear, forgiveness through the sacrifice of the Lamb. God provided a lamb. And you know what's interesting here? Uh, interesting side note. If you work backwards from this feast, this Passover meal, to the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem, you know what day he came into Jerusalem? And rem- remember, Exodus 12, on the 10th day of the month, go get yourself a lamb. And they named, they named the month there. Jesus rode into Jerusalem the exact same day they were told to go get their lamb, the 10th day. He could have rode into Jerusalem any day. He could have showed up a day earlier. He could have showed up a day later. But in God's just amazing design for how history was going to unfold, he provides the lamb Jesus into Jerusalem on the same day he had advised the Israelites to go choose their lamb without blemish. And then you bring it back and you hold it for five days, right? Tenth, the fourteenth, the twilight, you kill it. When did Jesus die? Same time. How's that work out? Right? That, that can't be orchestrated. That's, that's just God's beautiful design for creation, that he has uh, allowed this narrative of his to line up in ways that are uh, just begging, right? What Moses and Aaron do? A bunch of miracles, a bunch of signs, waving flags, hey, it's me. What Jesus do? A bunch of signs in front of the Pharisees, but they didn't believe. And, and maybe in the, the flow of history, God is even giving us in grace these signs, hey, do you notice this? It's pretty hard to orchestrate things that way. It's, it's me. I'm, I'm real. I see you. I care about you. He's waving his, his flag of invitation, right? And it's our choice. We get to follow after him or turn away. Um, Jesus is the bread. Uh, his blood becomes the wine. So uh, this week, as we go out of this place, I just want to set in front of you the, the invitation that, that is in Scripture of God showing up and inviting you to follow after him. And that's different for every single one of us. Maybe there's somebody in here that's the very first time that you need to say, I got a mess. And I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to deal with it. But it, it's a mess. And I don't want to share it with anybody. You can offer it up to God. Receive this gift of the Son. He washes it away. Right? Maybe for somebody else it's the hundredth time over. And you just need to say, all right, Lord, I'm in it. But I'm in it to stay. I'm still here with you. I'm going to persist in this. Uh, So no matter where you're at with that, just want to invite you uh, into receiving God's invitation. As we look forward to Easter, that balance of recognizing our sins put the Savior of the world on the cross, but he did it for us. And there's grace and forgiveness in that. Uh, We get to trust him and and love him for what he's done. Uh, So I want to close this with a, a time in prayer. I'll give just a moment for you to spend with the Lord and If there's anything on your heart you just want to lift up to him, or you want to ask him to to cover the the doorposts of your heart with the blood of his son, uh, that you would do that, and then I'll close this. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we know that uh, your word tells us that nobody can say Jesus is Lord without the help of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, so we pray, God, that your spirit would be at work this morning and uh, just taking the blinders off, um, softening hearts and hearts that are resentful, hearts that have been wounded, hearts that uh, have been told that there's no way you exist or there's no way you care for someone because of hardship that has been experienced or, um, Lord, uh, the sin of this world can blind people's eyes. So we're praying, God, that uh, this morning you would just give us all eyes to see 
and eyes uh, filled with hope and anticipation and uh, eyes that, that have this balance of humility and boldness to step forward and, and just to choose to trust you, to choose to trust that uh, there is an escape plan and it comes by following after you and, and turning towards you. And Lord, I trust and, and know and I'm grateful for this reality that uh, as we persist in, in faithful obedience, uh, there's going to be hard days, there's going to be mistakes along the way, and we're going to fall down and, and get a bruise, but uh, Lord, as we persist in following you, uh, we get to know your voice, and your sheep know your voice. And so we thank you that you do uh, speak into our lives, that um, you are alive and well and care for us, and we just pray as we go out into this world uh, that is hurting and broken, and we know people uh, that are hurting and broken, uh, they've been wounded or they've, they've caused hardship. God, we pray that uh, we could just be the, the salt of the earth and that the words we speak would be useful in uh, drawing people in and just uh, letting them know that, that there is another way to do life and um, it is an option and that we believe God is, is real and um, that we know he cares for us. So God, we just pray that you would use us in the ways you want to.